The presentations in this video series showcase work done by Rob Ellis and Ian McLeod of Geosoft Incorporated and Peter DiOrio of Geophysics One to elucidate the importance of auxiliary information in geophysical inversion. My name is Taronish Pithawala. In this first video, I will introduce the motivation for this presentation series and highlight the importance of auxiliary information in geophysical inversion. This diagram shows a generalized schematic of the inversion process. We have some observed data and we seek to solve for the model that yields the observed geophysical response. As we proceed through the inversion, we note that non-uniqueness yields a class of models that fit the data. Here is one such example of non-uniqueness. Both these inversion results, the shallow prisms and the basement topography, fit the observed data shown here. The suite of results from the inversion of this given data is entirely controlled by the auxiliary parameters. User inputs such as cell discretization, padding, and misfit distribution have profound effects on the resultant model. The investigation of any inversion model suite must take into account the application of these parameters. Moreover, the recreation of any inversion result depends on the choice of auxiliary inputs. The next series of videos are excerpts from the 2013 ASEG Inversion Forum presentation given by Rob Ellis entitled Auxiliary Information in Geophysical Inversion. This series will investigate the influence of and best practices surrounding model cell size, upward continuation and cell geometry, the padding domain, trend removal, error type and misfit distribution, errors and the regularization parameter, and finally, model weighting. Hello, this is Rob Ellis from Geosoft, and I'm giving a presentation on auxiliary information in geophysical inversion at the ASEG Inversion Forum in Melbourne. So let's look at the uh, inver inverse problem and break it down into its core component. One core component of the inverse problem is we have our geophysical data and we have a uh, numerical method for calculating the geophysical response given a particular Earth model. So given a uh, predicted response and an observed data, uh, we're able to somehow measure the difference between those two um, data sets and that will give us a misfit measure. Uh, which is uh, we're going to refer to as phi sub d. Uh, now we know that the inverse problem is ill-posed so we have to add some extra constraint and the extra constraint that we often had is that we want our final result to look like some sort of target model or reference model. So what we'll have is in our inversion is the our estimated model and we'll also measure how far away that is from our target model and to make that measurement we need a measure of the distance between those two models in model space and uh, we'll call that uh, phi m the model measure. And so now we've got a measure of our data and how far our predicted response is from our observed data and also how far away our inversion model is from some reference model that we've specified. And we need to combine those two pieces of information together in some way and uh, a common way to do that is uh, to form a ticking off um, regularization, if you like, to sum up this uh, data misfit measure and this model measure and uh, trade them off with a regularization parameter and then minimize the sum of the two of these terms. That's the inverse problem. Where does the auxiliary information come in? Well, it comes in everywhere. It comes in in how you determine this data misfit measure. Uh, maybe we normalize this uh, re the error associated with a data point. Um, perhaps there's a cover data covariance matrix that we need to use. Uh, perhaps we use an L2 norm or an L1 norm or L0 affinity norm. Uh, there's lots of different ways to form this particular measure. It's the same with the uh, model measure. Uh, maybe we can uh, take simply the uh, L2 norm of the difference of the two models, or we might uh, measure the derivative of the models and uh, try and minimize that in some way, or we may um, look for some more sophisticated uh, level set um, 
methods to uh, choose a particular model but in any case all these things are simply uh, defining a measure of the model uh, that we're going to use. And then of course we've got the trade-off uh, between the two terms here in this regularization parameter which we need to choose. So there's lots of uh, auxiliary information in this. Not to uh, forget the fact that the model itself uh, has to be discretized in some way. Uh, so there are cell sizes uh, in that discretization process. There's padding cells that need to be added around the model so that this uh, geophysical operator gives uh, meaningful results. The, the, uh, you can see that the auxiliary information is quite extensive. It's far more extensive than we could cover in this presentation. Uh, so we will only cover some selected aspects of it. One of the aspects uh, that we'll cover um, is related to this uh, data measure. So we're going to uh, consider the particular measure of the uh, data which uh, is actually of this form where we're going to take the observed data at each data point. We're going to uh, um, allow some trend to be removed from the data and <clears throat> we're also going to allow this uh, data misfit to be normalized by some data error associated with each data point and we will uh, use a P equal 2 and L2 norm um, and sum that up and call that our data misfit. So this is uh, a rather common form for the uh, data misfit measure. So we will examine the uh, uh, nature of this uh, error assignment and this trend removal in the examples that follow. We'll also look at auxiliary information associated with the model uh, space measure and the, uh, the form that we will use is uh, shown um, in this line here. Um, before I explain that I will say that this is a highly flexible um, part of the inversion and by far and away um, controls the, it has a very dramatic impact on the inversion result. So um, we will uh, construct our uh, model measure in the following way. We will say that we're going to uh, take the uh, difference between the target model and our predicted response, our uh, current model estimate, and uh, we will um, actually uh, choose a p equal 2 norm, an L2 norm, and uh, we'll have a term which depends on this uh, measure. I will also incorporate some gradient uh, uh, term into that, so we'll actually uh, say that our measure consists of uh, partly uh, measuring this difference and partly measuring the difference in the gradients of the model. And as I said before, there are many other um, pieces that can be added to this uh, particular term. We could add uh, minimum gradient support terms or focusing terms. Uh, really this is uh, completely up to the uh, programmer or uh, geophysicist as to what they uh, incorporate in this term. Uh, we're only going to examine one, the effect of one particular term in that and that's this going to be this WD uh, which is a uh, related um, to a weighting uh, in the uh, inversion. Uh, as I said the uh, auxiliary information also uh, comes in through the model and the, uh, the models that we choose and their numerical representations. We need to um, decide on the size of the model elements, that's the discretization, uh, the geometry of the earth, uh, what sort of cells uh, we're going to use, uh, are they going to be voxels, will they be uh, arbitrarily shaped elements. Uh, we need to understand how far and how we're going to treat the model outside our area of interest outside and so this is the padding domain. Um, we uh, also should really consider uh, the parameterization of the earth elements. elements. Do we need them to be, uh, are they satisfactory to be scalars or do they need to be vectors for example? Is the susceptibility sufficient or do we need to use a magnetization vector for the particular problem? Um, do we have uh, an isotropy in this case or are the, uh, is the Earth uh, isotropic? Uh, and so there are a number of uh, decisions that have to be made in terms of the uh, model itself and we're going to consider those which are most, uh, which impact the practicing geophysicists the most, for example the size, so the geometry and padding uh, of the uh, elements. So now let's uh, 
also look at uh, the auxiliary information that goes into this uh, regularization parameter, that is how we trade off between the data misfit and the structure in the model. Um, there are many ways to choose this particular parameter and depending on how the parameter is chosen one either fits the data better and uh, gains structure in the model or makes the model uh, more like the uh, reference model and uh, increases the data misfit. A typical approach that we use, uh, commonly use, is a Tikhonov regularization which is this particular form and then we minimize this, uh, the, uh, the weighted sum of these two terms and uh, we can minimize in a number of different ways uh, but uh, in almost all cases we need to estimate this parameter and one way to do that is with uh, some geophysical experience that's actually looking at the result of different choices of the parameter and deciding as a geophysicist which one you think is the best. Uh, we can use a misfit criterion if we're prepared to define a data misfit um, or we can try and use something called the corner of the L curve uh, and uh, or a generalized cross-validation criterion, uh, we will uh, in this presentation compare geophysical experience with the uh, misfit and the L-curve corner criteria. So let's begin, uh, start digging into this. Uh, let's look at the auxiliary information associated with model cell size. We know that all Earth models must be discretized before we can uh, work with them numerically. And we're often left with the question as a practicing geophysicist, well, how big a cell should I use? Um, are more cells better simply because uh, they give me more resolution or um, should they be something like uh, chosen something like a gridding condition so that there's uh, four cells per line spacing or um, if I want a 20 meter resolution should I just simply use 20 meter cells. So these are possible rules of thumb. We're going to investigate the effect of cell size. Um, we're going to use a synthetic model which includes dipping prisms, uh, small plates and dikes and variable line spacing and uh, survey height and we're going to compute the TMI response and sub subsequently invert the data varying the cell size and see when the cell size starts to become an issue. So the uh, case that we study uh, is uh, shown here. These are dipping um, prisms. Uh, here are small plates and here are three dikes uh, uh, running through the model. We're going to uh, consider a field inclination of 90 degrees, so these uh, survey altitude of 50 meters and cell sizes ranging from 10, 20, uh, 40, 80 and 120 meters. And we'll compare them and we'll start to see uh, what the cell size is for this particular survey and you can see here that the line spacing varies 50 meter line spacing, 100 meter line spacing and 200 meter line spacing. Uh, so here I'm showing you the, uh, the results of uh, the inversion of that particular data with a 10 meter cell size. I'm showing you the entire model here and I'm showing you a um, box hole threshold model over here and you can see that uh, in this particular case with 10 meter cells um, everything is reasonably well recovered by this particular inversion and so we're going to consider this our benchmark. We're going to we then on the bottom what I've done is increase the cell size to 20 meters and I've reinverted and what we see is that the 10 and 20 meter cell size inversions are practically identical. And on the right in this box here I'm showing you the difference uh, of those uh, of these uh, two models, the benchmark and the 20 meter. And you can see that there's basically no difference. So from this we can tell that 20 meter cells and 10 meter cells are just as effective. Let's look at 40 meter cells versus the benchmark again on the top the benchmark and on the bottom here 40 meter cells. This uh, you can see over here the difference between these two models now and basically there's a uh, small difference coming in but uh, it's localized uh, to the tops uh, um, of the shallow bodies and really the again the difference is uh, for um, exploration purposes uh, negligible. So 10, 20 or 40 meter cell sizes don't really make any difference. Let's move to an 80 meter cell size. So now what we're starting to see is that there is some difference coming in. The benchmark is shown here. 
the inversion result for 80 meter cells is shown underneath and what you can see is that uh, now if we compare these two and look at the difference shown over here yes we are starting to see some differences so the our uh, conclusion is that uh, once we've gone to 80 meter cell sizes we're starting to impact the quality of the inversion but notice one thing uh, in particular the line spacing really has made no difference to this uh, result so it doesn't matter whether we've uh, worked at 50 meters uh, 100 meter line spacing or 200 meter line spacing the cell size doesn't just seems to be independent of the line spacing and now I've gone to 120 meter cells and you can see here that the inversion uh, result is starting to be severely impacted by the uh, large cells that have been used. Uh, I'm showing you here a, a slightly different view. This is through a section through one of these small plates um, for uh, the different cell sizes and you can see here 10 meter cells, 20 meter cells, 40 meter cells, 80 meter cells and 120 meter cells. And you can see that uh, 10 meter cells on the benchmark yes we're able to invert we pick up a dipping structure um, at 20 meters it's very similar 40 meters virtually identical still 80 meters we start to see a breakdown and 120 meters we're only getting a uh, hint of the structure itself now what we can conclude is that optimum voxel size is not a strong function of line separation but it is a function of the frequency content of the source data and this study and numerous other ones that we've performed uh, provide us with the rule of thumb that once the that one way to determine the optimum cell size is to take the data that's provided subsample it um, I will uh, filter it anti-alias filter it and subsample it at a discretization equal to the cell size and once that anti-aliased discretized data starts to deviate significantly from the observed data the inversion will be negatively impacted by that cell size so this is a uh, way without prior to running any inversion of determining what a uh, an, um, a uh, optimum or at least very good voxel size will be for the inversion and uh, for a rule of thumb uh, for for example for airborne magnetics this would simply be a half to one times the uh, source sensor separation so a half to one times the uh, clearance um, of the survey okay so that's our first uh, study of auxiliary information let's now look at cell geometry in this particular case I'm going to turn to the San Nicolas deposit in uh, central Mexico uh, it's a uh, uh, massive sulfide deposit uh, we can see here a deposit model has been built by uh, Camiro um, uh, my Mara Geosciences is part of a Camiro project and uh, what uh, we can see from uh, this is that there is a, uh, a, a massive sulfide deposit uh, in the center of this uh, volume this uh, deposit model and there are a number of uh, there's a dike that runs through here rhyolite dike and a fault that runs through uh, in this direction um, and a number of different uh, uh, mudstones and uh, um, volcanic breaches and various other layer, uh, layers that uh, des uh, describe the deposit and uh, here I'm uh, describing that in a little more detail we can see that this uh, massive uh, sulfide zone is about 280 meters thick about 900 meters long and about 300 meters wide uh, the top of the uh, sulfide lies approximately uh, 150 to 200 meters below the surface and it's covered by 100 meters of Mayfield volcanics and uh, sedimentary rocks um, and those in turn are uh, covered by 50 meters of tertiary volcanic um, breaches volcanoclastic breaches now the uh, 
terrain in this area, which is uh, what are we really going to focus on here, um, is uh, is very minimal. In fact, there's only uh, sort of 60 meters uh, uh, variation over this entire area. Um, and uh, what uh, what we can see here is that uh, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to voxelize this uh, particular model, and in that process, the train will be represented by a uh, series of layers of voxels. And um, e as we step uh, through the model, uh, going from the lower side to the higher side, we step through a number of transitions where the uh, voxels step up, and the next layer is used to describe the terrain. And so this uh, this shows uh, the voxel representation. And here's the uh, uh, terrain shown uh, as it uh, was measured uh, with a in the Falcon survey. And basically, we can see that there is uh, roughly 40 meters of terrain over this area. Now. The uh, exploration question that uh, might be asked in this particular case is uh, we conclude that optimum voxel size is not a strong function of line separation but it is a function of spatial frequency content of the source data. Optimum voxel size can then be determined by <coughs> anti-alias filtering and subsampling the field data at one point per voxel size and increasing that voxel size until there is a deviation between the observed field data and the anti-aliased subsample data. We're showing that here in this uh, slide which shows the uh, true data in a red and the anti-aliased subsample data for different cell sizes as well and here we see that the cell size for 20 and 40 meter cell sizes uh, the data is still um, consistent and so these are good uh, voxel sizes however when we go to 80 meter cell sizes the anti-alias subsample data is started to deviate from the uh, true data and at 120 meters it's clearly uh, doing a poor job of representing the true data. So this uh, is one way in which prior to inversion we can ensure that we have an optimum uh, voxel size. Um, in simple terms this uh, translates into a rule of thumb for example for airborne magnetics uh, where the optimum cell size is somewhere between a half to one times the minimum source sensor separation or effectively uh, the clearance. In this section we're going to consider the necessity for upward continuation of data before it's processed uh, in a geophysical inversion and the auxiliary information associated with that is how much upward continuation is required and to some extent this uh, upward continuation is uh, dependent on the geometry of the cells that are used in the model so let's investigate that now And what we know is that a uh, common cell geometry used in practical geophysical inversions is, uh, is the simple prism. But using prisms to represent the Earth um, is, uh, is a poor approximation in certain instances and particularly for the terrain. So what we're going to do in this case, we'll look at the terrain at, in a very uh, flat area, uh, central Mexico over the San Nicolas deposit, and we'll see how much up continuation is necessary uh, dependent on the cell thicknesses in the voxel representation of this model. Uh, the uh, San Nicolas deposit is a VMS deposit, and the uh, basic um, facts are on the deposit are shown here. Uh, it's the massive sulphide zone itself is about 300 meters thick, 900 meters long, and about 300 meters wide, and it lies uh, about 200 meters below the surface, covered by 100 meters of Mayfield volcanic flows and sedimentary rocks, which are in turn covered by uh, 50 to 100 meters of tertiary volcanoclastic breaches. 
Now, uh, what's important here is that uh, all of these rock units um, have a susceptibility. Indeed, the overburden susceptibility is 0 0.005, and the ore zone itself is uh, actually only twice that susceptibility, 0 0.01. So uh, what we have is a situation where the overburden is susceptible and we need to um, determine what uh, effect that susceptible overburden has on our uh, modelling and inversion. So what we're going to do first is we're going to uh, take our um, deposit uh, model representation and convert it into a voxel model, voxelize it. What you can see when you do that is that the uh, terrain itself, although flat, um, is represented by a series of uh, steps and then large flats areas and then steps um, as you go part through the model. Now this is uh, magnified here in this image. You can see the flat surface, this step up. Uh, in this case it's a 20 meter step. Uh, these are 20 meter cells and uh, so that's the representation of this true terrain uh, in the voxel form. Now what happens when we calculate the, uh, <clears throat> for example, the uh, TMI or uh, magnetic field response over the top of this body um, is shown in the following slide. Here uh, we calculate the Um, actually what we're showing is the RTP response um, over the uh, voxel model uh, calculated um, at a half cell clearance. So this would be 10 meters above this uh, model. And then we calculate again at 20 meters above the model and then at 40 meters above the model. And then again at 60 meters above the model and then 100 meters above the model and 200 meters above the model. And of course what we can see at these uh, low clearances is clear evidence of these um, voxel or prism artifacts associated with steps in the train. Indeed that's all we see really. It completely dominates the uh, response from the ore zone itself. So and it's really not until we get up to a clearance of approximately eight uh, cell thicknesses, that's about uh, 160 meters above this model do we start to um, no longer see those artifacts and get a accurate representation of the uh, magnetic response. So you bear we bear that in mind it takes about uh, 160 meters here or eight cell thicknesses and then we come back and we ask ourselves well what's the usual rule of thumb that's often quoted in these situations and um, frequently it's uh, half to one cell thickness what we're seeing here is in reality you actually need a lot more than that I would mention of course that um, the amount of upward continuation you need depends on the type of uh, model that you're using. If you're using prisms we've shown we need to upward continue about eight cell thicknesses. However with something uh, in a modeling uh, scenario where the model elements actually conform to the terrain and there is no voxel uh, artifact you see that um, even at half cell clearance you're getting a very good representation of the model. I would draw your attention to this feature which uh, runs across here. This is a rhyolite dike. Uh, we can see that in the uh, model. I'm illustrating it here and you can see it here in the voxel model and it's completely absent in the uh, prism voxel representation uh, until we get up to uh, uh, or it's completely dominated by the prism artifacts and and it becomes almost uh, invisible. However in the uh, conforming cell uh, type model we uh, we see uh, a very good representation so the uh, degree of upward continuation using prism elements is about eight cells um, and uh, for conforming cells uh, it's significantly less probably uh, half a cell um, it would be absolutely sufficient in some cases no upward continuation will be required at all. So this is uh, to summarize what I've just been saying. Um, upward continuation of approximately eight cell thicknesses is required to avoid prism artifacts. And the reason that I chose this San Nicolas 
um, example is because it's a largely flat area and it's often um, thought that this problem of upward continuation or terrain artifact uh, would be um, only uh, an issue in um, rugged terrain. Uh, what we're actually, uh, what a conclusion we could draw from this is that in the presence of uh, largely flat areas and if you're using prism based elements uh, it may well be better to simply ignore the terrain altogether. Uh, the uh, errors introduced by ignoring the terrain are probably significantly less than the errors associated with the uh, prism artifacts. Of course uh, uh, that uh, is a uh, very dangerous uh, approximation to make. And we uh, certainly recommend the use of terrain conforming cells. Alright, so now let's turn our attention to another feature of the model itself and that is how much padding is required around the model uh, to avoid artifacts associated with objects which are peripheral to the model zone uh, or the area of interest. And again uh, we have a number of rules of thumb. Um, these include uh, something like uh, three cells is enough, five, five layers of cells is enough, um, or the padding should be included to the uh, extended to the depth of the model or uh, we need to use half the width of the model as padding. Uh, all these are rules of thumb which I've heard over the years. Uh, so we need to uh, try and uh, pin down this auxiliary information a little, a little much better. So we'll uh, investigate the effects of uh, the padding area using a Cannington style model. Uh, the Cannington is a, uh, a deposit in um, central, well, uh, northwestern Queensland. I'm showing uh, its location up here in the map of Australia. And here's a uh, geology of the uh, Mount Isa in Lyre. And uh, Cannington is located down here on this southeast uh, corner. So uh, here's the uh, regional um, TMI to show the uh, magnetic context. And this is the area that we'll be working uh, with, just this small area over the Cannington deposit itself. To determine the amount of padding that's needed, uh, we're going to first build a simple susceptibility model to represent the Cannington deposit. And then we're going to add two bodies peripheral to that model, which are going to generate responses within the area of interest and so interfere with our inversion. And we are going to then invert with different numbers of a different amount of padding and determine what the optimum amount of padding is to eliminate the effect in the inversion zone of the bodies which are exterior to the zone but which contribute signal inside the area of interest. So to begin we form our simplified Cannington model. What I'm showing you here in the grid image is the TMI over Cannington and here I'm showing the two bodies that we are using to simulate the Cannington response. So this is our artificial Cannington. And the response from our artificial Cannington deposit is shown over here in this series of profiles. What we have in fact is uh, <coughs> the our uh, simulated uh, Cannington bodies, the north and south zone, and the true or uh, measured uh, TMI response over Cannington, which is shown in black, and the response from our um, simulated Cannington shown in red. And you can see that we have approximately represented the true Cannington by this simple body. Once we have this simple body, we'll use our um, inversion to see if we can, uh, how accurately we can recover these, uh, this simple model. 
So then the second step is having our simple uh, Cannington model. We add two cylindrical stocks uh, which are exterior to the uh, inversion domain but which contribute signal within that domain and here I'm showing the um, TMI response uh, over Cannington with the contribution from the cylindrical stock and you can see that the cylindrical stocks have contributed signal into this uh, domain of interest and yet they're peripheral to the actual volume of interest so it's the use of padding cells which allows us to avoid serious edge effects in the model when we run our inversion. So to begin what uh, we'll do as a benchmark is we will invert the uh, synthetic Cannington data and we'll do that with uh, no uh, cylindrical stocks present and this will form our benchmark and this will be the if you like the definition of a good inversion result. Next we add the response from the cylindrical stocks and re-invert and we do this firstly with no padding cells. So you can see the effect on the inversion of, of the cylindrical stocks, uh, one on the east, one on the south, and there's a huge contamination of the inversion and the uh, target is completely obscured by, this, uh, by the effect of the signal from these exterior bodies. Next we add two padding cells and we run the inversion again and we see a remarkable improvement uh, in the inversion result. In fact the target bodies, our target Cannington, um, is uh, well recovered and the, two, the padding cells have allowed us to uh, effectively exclude um, the effect of those uh, cylindrical stocks from the model domain. So what we see here is the remarkable result that just two padding cells um, is uh, sufficient to largely reduce the effect of uh, exterior bodies on the inversion. What I've done here is gone through and uh, tried three, four, five and seven um, padding cells and uh, what basically happens as we add more padding cells um, the susceptibility in the padding cells is, is reduced. It's reduced from uh, about 0.8 here down to 0.65 to 0.49 and 0.42 as we increase the number of padding cells. And so this is uh, pretty much what one uh, would expect. Uh, with fewer padding cells the effect has to be more concentrated in those cells. So what we can conclude here is that padding is essential. Uh, we can conclude that even two or three padding cells is hugely beneficial and uh, largely eliminates the spurious effects of sources outside the model. And the <clears throat> Uh, rule of thumb that we would probably come up with is that uh, five padding cells is uh, certainly sufficient uh, for eliminating spurious effects in the model. So the auxiliary information in this case is uh, that five padding cells is sufficient. Now let us uh, turn our attention to the auxiliary information associated with trend removal. Uh, <clears throat> Quite often we find that uh, geophysical data, in fact almost always we find that geophysical data contains contributions from sources other than those uh, of inversion interests, so other than the targets we're interested in. Um, these contributions can uh, arise from deep or peripheral structures and <clears throat> uh, one way we can uh, eliminate them um, is to uh, allow the inversion to remove a trend or to remove a trend from the data prior to the inversion. And what we're going to, uh, the question we're trying to ask here is uh, what sort of trend removal uh, is optimum? Uh, should uh, we be removing a simple mean from the data, a first order trend, maybe a second order trend, and uh, how that uh, affects the inversion result? So what we've taken, what we've done here is gone back to our Cannington data. We've taken the Cannington field data in this case and we've added uh, an artificial linear trend to the data. So what I'm showing you here is the uh, Cannington field data with an artificial trend 
um, embedded in it and underneath it I'm showing the result of inverting that data with no linear trend removal so just inverting that data directly in the second case here I'm showing this data after a first order trend has been removed and I'm showing you the result of inverting this data with a first order trend which incorporates the first order trend removal and on the third case over here I'm showing you the data after a second order trend removal and the result of inversion of that data what we can see here is that when we do not remove a trend from the data um, the inversion result is um, less like the uh, true model than uh, we would like. Uh, what I'm showing here is a, a drawing of the true mineralization at Cannington um, on this model. Uh, you can see it uh, folded down here and the recovered model without trend removal uh, indicates the dipping structure but not uh, much of the extent. If I do a first order trend removal and then invert, now the uh, structure of the data, the, uh, the model itself is better recovered and looks more like the true structure and interestingly, although there does not seem to be much difference between these two uh, data sets, uh, removing a second order trend um, does a much better job, does a better job again of uh, preparing the data and allowing us to invert more accurately for uh, the true Cannington uh, mineralization. <coughs> what I'm showing you in this slide is the uh, mean uh, or the uh, removing a constant from the data and removing a first order trend from the data but in the previous slide I just showed you this volume inside with no padding cells associated with it and in this case uh, I'm showing you the padding cells uh, which result from um, this inversion of this data with no trend removal and what you'll see is that the padding cells are, are populated here with susceptibility and this um, in the padding cells is necessary to produce the linear trend in the model area which um, we have ignored or not removed from the data before inversion. Uh, on, in the, on the right here what I'm showing you is the same result, the inversion result with padding cells with a first order trend removal before the inversion takes place and you can see that the um, padding cells are much less uh, necessary and have much smaller contribution to supplying uh, regional trend. Um, so that is why this uh, linear trend removal works uh, so it works well because uh, the inversion does not have to add material in the padding domain uh, which it does here when the trend is not removed from the data. So uh, our conclusion would be that uh, unless the user has um, paid special attention and created a special, a special uh, regional residual separation uh, a, a very good uh, rule of thumb is to remove a first order trend or possibly a second order trend from the data as part of the inversion process. Now let's turn our attention to the auxiliary information associated with um, <clears throat> the error type and misfit distribution. Um, <clears throat> If we go back and recall our uh, definition of the data measure, uh, we describe the fact that we were going to use um, <clears throat> a difference between the observed data and our predicted response and we were going to normalize it by some data error. And so this uh, is essentially forming a uh, chi-squared uh, measure of the data fit and <clears throat> we need to know if we're going to form this is the uh, error that we should associate with the data. Now unfortunately we don't have this information um, in a satisfactory form from the uh, survey itself um, because the error actually involves all sources of error not only the uh, error associated with the instrument but the uh, error associated with uh, uh, locating the sensor in space with the discretization of the model uh, all sorts of errors are all rolled into this. So 
what we know and what we'll show is that the uh, type of error uh, that we choose can control the misfit distribution uh, in the solution. And what we'll also see a little bit later is that the size of the error controls the amount of structure um, in, the, in the inversion result. So in this section we're going to simply examine the uh, difference between using relative and absolute errors uh, for this error component here. These are two common choices in uh, geophysical inversion. And to understand this uh, um, the difference between relative and absolute errors and the effect on uh, inversion. Uh, we'll consider this synthetic model here which has uh, two susceptible dipping prisms. Uh, it has a number of uh, plate-like targets and a uh, dike coming through. And the susceptibilities have been chosen so that the red bodies produce anomalies which are about ten times larger than the cyan and green bodies. We'll see why that's uh, important in a moment. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, generate uh, our synthetic data over that particular model. And the data is shown here with a linear color stretch. And we'll examine two cases. We'll firstly examine 8% uh, relative error and 20 nanotesla um, absolute error. And we'll compare the uh, inversion results for these two cases and see uh, what the difference is. Now, on the top here, I'm showing you the uh, inversion result with an 8% relative error. And on the bottom, I'm showing you the inversion result with a 10 nanotesla error. And here, I'm showing you the results along a single profile across that uh, model. And it is, in fact, this uh, profile uh, line across, uh, across here shown dashed in white. And what we, uh, what we notice in that... Uh, data in the measured data we see a big uh, large response over this dipping prism we see a uh, weak response over the small dipping plate and a uh, moderate sized response over the <clears throat> dike now what's uh, interesting is that when we uh, run our inversion we can calculate the predicted response from the model that we achieve and we can see when we use the relative error an interesting thing here the uh, uh, the relative error, of course, allows deviation of the predicted response to be greater when the data values themselves are greater. So it allows a uh, greater misfit and, if you like, an underfitting of the peaks of, this, uh, of these um, larger bodies. However, because the relative error is uh, considerably smaller over the small anomalies, we see that we get a, uh, re a good fit to these uh, weaker structures. So what we're seeing in this case is that the uh, dominant structures are perhaps a little bit underfit, but we are, being se we are sensitive to the uh, weaker and more subtle features in the data. So using a relative error is, uh, has these particular consequences. However, if we use an absolute error, we can see that we uh, more closely honour the uh, extremes in the data, the large uh, responses, uh, but we start to lose with the uh, smaller features. So the point we're trying to make here is that using relative error um, produces a more um, uniform um, recovery of... Uh, the uh, items in the uh, model area, whereas the absolute error focuses more on the uh, larger and more dominant targets. And the consequence of that is that if we're doing a relative error inversion, we will see these small bodies as well as these large bodies. But if we do an absolute error, uh, we will um, more than likely uh, start to lose some of the weaker features, but we'll still maintain the and fit better these larger structures. So our conclusion here is that the choice of error is basically controlling the misfit distribution in the inversion. And so for situations with extremely large local responses, it may be helpful to work with relative errors. Uh, more subtle features in the model will be illuminated while the dominant features are de-emphasized. For most situations, however, without extreme responses, absolute errors provide a uh, more or less uniform misfit distribution and uniformly emphasize uh, model features. 
Now we turn to auxiliary information associated with errors and uh, a related quantity, the regularization parameter. If I go back and look at my definition of the inverse problem, I said it's basically a trade-off between um, a data measure and a model measure, and that trade-off is controlled by this regularization parameter lambda. If I use my simple form for the data measure, which is shown here, uh, and my and I uh, construct the total uh, objective function shown here, then I am left with this uh, total objective quantity which is uh, shown here with a delta D and a denominator here and a uh, lambda regularization parameter over here. And you can see that if I'm minimizing this quantity then uh, effectively the uh, absolute or the overall scale of the errors and the trade-off parameter itself or the regularization parameter are related and so if we study one or the other of these it's sufficient to um, provide us with information about the auxiliary information that's necessary to uh, optimize our inversion. So we will uh, look at the regularization parameter and how to choose this parameter uh, for our inversion. <clears throat> so how, what uh, what is the uh, or how can we view the effect of this regularization parameter? Well. Um, as I said, we have our um, data measure and our model measure and the uh, trade-off between the two of them. And we can solve the uh, inverse problem by, for different values of uh, lambda, the regularization parameter. And we can plot the model measure versus the data measure. And that's what I'm showing you here on this curve. I'm showing you the data measure on this axis and the model measure on the vertical axis for different values of lambda. And what we see is that as we uh, change lambda from a large value uh, to a uh, smaller value, uh, the plot of uh, these uh, data measure versus model measure has a very characteristic form and that's called the L curve. It looks a bit like an L and uh, this is a result which is typically found and, and shown in uh, textbooks. Um, and uh, the essence of it is that if uh, the trader, uh, the regularization parameter is too small, we overfit the data and the model becomes too noisy. And if the regularization parameter is too large, we underfit the data and the model becomes too bland. So the uh, question is, how do we uh, choose this correct value of regularization parameter? So there are a number of different ways of choosing the regularization parameter and we need to try and find out which of those is going to work for us. One method that uh, works is to simply, or one method we can use, is to simply say, well, I know what my, or I'm going to define what I think my data misfit should be and maybe it should be uh, 5 nanotesla. And then I'm going to run my inversion and I'm going to choose the point, uh, I'm going to choose the trade-off parameter value here um, such that uh, I have a data uh, misfit of 5 nanotesla. This is a uh, simple and uh, very efficient method. Another method that's uh, um, often promoted, um, again, ac uh, I suppose academically, um, is to choose the corner of this uh, curve here, the uh, corner of the L curve, and this uh, the point of maximum curvature. And this uh, um, is uh, under some conditions um, a, a very good choice, um, perhaps considered an optimal choice for the data. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, finally, a uh, third rel uh, third choice, which is uh, um, sometimes mentioned but not often used, is a uh, generalized cross-validation procedure for choosing uh, yet another point, which will which often ends up being very close to this uh, corner. So let's uh, look at a. Uh, a case we're going to consider a synthetic case first. I've got a uh, prism in a half space. Um, I've added noise to that uh, data. I have then inverted it. 
and I'm going to now show you the results of choosing the miss the inversion result a section through the model when I choose the misfit criteria and when I choose the L curve corner criteria and <clears throat> firstly you can see in this uh, case with a synthetic model with Gaussian noise prism in a half space I get something which is a nice L curve and um, if I choose the misfit condition this is the uh, a section through the uh, recovered model that I will achieve and if I use the L curve it will be this um, situation here. So you can see that the misfit condition um, and the L curve condition are both uh, very similar in this instance and the L curve is nice and sharp and relatively sharp. However, let's try and be a little more realistic and in this case I'm going to go back to my San Nicolas deposit and I'm going to use uh, Falcon data which was collected over this courtesy of Tech Resources Limited and the Falcon data contains a magnetic uh, TMI response over the uh, uh, San Nicolas deposit and <clears throat> It also uh, contains the uh, Falcon um, N, E and U, V components. I'm just showing you a, a derived GZZ here because it's uh, simpler to interpret. Um, so we've got uh, data. It's uh, flown at 100 metre clearance with a 250 metre line spacing. And the uh, range on this uh, colour scale here is about 40 nanoteslas and about 70 atvos down here. Now I run my inversion on that in exactly the same way as I had before with my um, uh, synthetic model and the first thing I see uh, here is that uh, um, I have a, uh, an L curve but it's clearly much weaker, it's really uh, more of a dimple in a, uh, in a more or less overall curve so it becomes, uh, what we find is that once we get to using field data these algorithmic methods of choosing the trade-off parameter become um, more challenging. So uh, in this case uh, the misfit uh, condition that we've used for the inverting the magnetic data from the Falcon survey uh, was 5% uh, of the signal standard deviation and that's uh, shown here and the model that I recover from that I'm showing a section here and you can see the um, susceptibility high associated with the uh, San Nicolas deposit on this inversion and here uh, again I've taken the corner result and I'm showing that here and you can see if you look closely that there's uh, slightly more structure in this model um, one has to wonder whether it's uh, starting to pick up the noise um, but uh, the, the main essence is that the corner L curve corner and the misfit condition um, even though they seem to be separated um, <clears throat> so um, in the uh, on the L curve, they do in fact produce uh, rather similar models. So again, from this uh, case with magnetic data, um, this is you know this is very this is low noise data, and uh, we've got uh, two reasonable inversion results out. And uh, what I'm showing now for the uh, Falcon uh, TMI data again is the, uh, the two results we saw. That's the misfit condition, the L-curve corner. And then what happens if we start to push the uh, trade-off parameter even smaller? Well, what happens is we start to get more and more noise building up in the model. And in this instance, um, even pushing the L-curve to something quite small does not uh, really destroy the model significantly so there's a certain stability in this uh, in this uh, data. If I make the regularization parameter large then of course the model starts to smooth off and I uh, see uh, see the um, this much uh, smoother model. Now what happens if we look at the uh, Falcon AGG data? This is the gravity gradiometer data. Well I've repeated this process here and um, constructed the L curve for it and you can see here that now the L curve has become uh, truly uh, very indistinct and is indeed um, just a minor deflection on the, uh, the L curve. The corner is a minor deflection on the L curve itself. Now what I'm also showing you here uh, is the uh, misfit condition uh, with a 7 atvos noise. Um, experience tells us that uh, the Falcon system at this time was uh, achieving about 7 atvos noise. 
and so uh, that would uh, define the position on the L curve of our uh, misfit criterion and you can see in fact that the uh, defined misfit criterion is uh, is in fact in this case close to any corner that you might possibly uh, deduce from this L curve and on the uh, here what I'm showing you is uh, actually what uh, the geophysicist might um, consider to be the best uh, choice of this uh, regularization parameter. Uh, so at the top here I'm showing you the inversion uh, result uh, satisfying 7 at boss noise uh, or the L curve corner both of them very close together so the model uh, is effectively the same for both of them and you can see it's actually quite a noisy uh, model so um, as an interpreter as a geophysicist I would look at this and I would say that's probably overfit um, so I would go back and uh, um, reduce the uh, uh, amount of emphasis put on fitting the data and uh, emphasize more the uh, smoothing structure and uh, that would cause me to come drop down here on the old curve to this position so this is if you like the uh, experienced geophysicists um, choice of regularization parameter so with the San Nicolas Falcon data. I'm showing you now the uh, two curves I've just shown you before the uh, misfit criteria and the old curve uh, criteria model. Um, perhaps a little too noisy. The uh, geophysicist's uh, interpretation of what might be uh, realistic in this uh, from this data, and what happens if we, on the other hand, start to force the uh, or start to reduce the uh, trade-off parameter and what you can see the regularization parameter so what you can see here is that the model breaks up into an incredibly noisy and um, meaningless uh, meaningless uh, model so with this uh, much noisier Falcon data um, there is no um, sort of stability that we saw in the uh, low noise magnetic data it's uh, much more problematic and uh, also as we increase the um, trade off the uh, regularization parameter uh, we see uh, much more smoothness come into the model so these are the two N members here um, and uh, this is our uh, algorithmic uh, if you like um, estimate and this is the experienced geophysicist estimate so what I would conclude from this is that um, these algorithmic regularization um, parameter choices appear to be uh, most useful for limited classes of noise distribution. That's for relatively low noise, or uncorrelated noise, and something, and uh, and basically even Gaussian noise. They they would work very well. Um, we I'd, I'd consider the L curve can yield very interesting information however in practice it's rather costly because you have to calculate an inversion uh, model for each value of this regularization parameter and it um, produces results which are close to the uh, uh, misfit criteria now this is really um, probably uh, uh, well, well, well the, the reason that the L curve does not uh, really add too much value or one reason is that uh, we get quite experienced as geophysicists in estimating the uh, noise um, on our data so after you've examined a number of Falcon surveys um, one can uh, reasonably estimate what might be a reasonable uh, error level so you can set a reasonable misfit criterion well the same with uh, magnetic field data or EM data or any other data uh, once you interpret a few data sets um, you are able to uh, fairly accurately define a misfit criterion so this uh, um, biases the uh, usefulness of this criterion and um, in uh, practice of course no algorithm can substitute for geophysical experience and um, it's my belief that uh, most uh, geophysicists running inversions will probably want to uh, try uh, either fitting the data a little better or a little worse to uh, a little less to uh, see if they can optimize their inversion result.
Now let's uh, look at a uh, an, another type, form of uh, auxiliary information and now we're going to talk about model weighting and uh, model weighting is a very uh, important part of the um, inversion process. Uh, it comes in as I said uh, earlier through the model measure, the uh, process or the uh, machinery that we use to um, ensure that our model looks something like our uh, preconception of what we think it should look like. So here I'm showing you the uh, <coughs> expression that we use for our model measure. It can be a very complicated expression. I'm not going to explain each of these terms. Uh, what I'm going to focus on is simply this uh, weighting function WD here. And <coughs> uh, these Ws are essentially arbitrary. Uh, the uh, geophysicist or the algorithm designer can choose them in any way that they want. And uh, <coughs> They, in fact, uh, have a uh, powerful uh, control on the recovered model and uh, we're going to investigate how this WD weighting can be used to control the depth of the uh, recovered uh, target. So what, uh, what I will do um, is I will uh, show you the uh, result of uh, setting WD to be some function of the depth uh, times a natural decay of the sensitivities of this uh, of the geophysical uh, inverse problem. And I'll consider three cases uh, demonstrating a shallow model, a uh, model which um, is opt which is uh, placed at a target which is placed at a depth um, consistent with a point source and a deep model. So there will be three different values of uh, weighting function used and we will see the results of those and I'll show it first over a uh, synthetic case and then over the San Nicolas deposit. So here's a simple case. Uh, we have the geophysical survey over a uh, prism or ore zone, simple ore zone in a uh, more or less uniform earth. And if I set my weighting function to be something like uh, 1 over Z, I will end up with a rather shallow model. So I've taken my data from Locke and I've inverted it with this weighting function and I've produced a model uh, which has a response that fits the data um, and uh, everything's very uh, sufficient. So if you like, this might be the paleo channel uh, interpretation and uh, what I'm showing in these slides is a section view through this model space and uh, I, you can see faintly here the location of the uh, prism body. Now if I uh, set my weighting function to a uh, constant value of 1 I will recover a model shown by this uh, uh, red uh, oval here and this uh, this uh, value of weighting uh, function, I set it to 1, essentially is returning a model which if it was a point uh, would be uh, the uh, point response um, would be uh, more or less centered in this uh, prism. And then <coughs> I'm uh, showing at the bottom here the result of inverting with a weighting function uh, proportional to Z and uh, it, will produ it produces a very deep model. So these are the three inversion results that you see here as sections and uh, <coughs> each of them produces a model which fits this data uh, effectively uh, exactly. So this is the uh, effect of the weighting function controlling the depth of the recovered response. So that's how it works in a uh, on a uh, synthetic case, let's see how it now uh, the effect of this on uh, field data. So here I'm now taking my <coughs> field data from the uh, Falcon survey, the TMI data over the uh, San Nicolas deposit, and I'm inverting it, and I'm showing you the result here using the shallow weighting function. So this is the uh, if you like, generates the paleo channel or flat lying interpretation. So what we mean is it'll produce models which are essentially shallow and flat lying. And you can see uh, here that indeed the result is uh, very shallow, um, certainly not in any way consistent with the uh, VMS uh, deposit at uh, San Nicolas. 
Next I will show you the result of changing this weighting from 1 on Z to constant value of 1 and now what we see is the inversion is producing a uh, model at a depth uh, which is uh, completely consistent with this uh, VMS target so uh, this is if you like the uh, compact or uh, um, compact or VMS uh, type interpretation Finally, I uh, show you the inversion result if I uh, assume a Z uh, weighting and what you can see when you do that of course is that um, everything is uh, um, pushed deep in the model and so uh, this would be an interpretation based on um, a deep intrusive causing this uh, type of uh, magnetic response that we're seeing. So going back through those, I have a paleo, possible paleo channel interpretation, a uh, compact um, VMS type interpretation, and a deep intrusive interpretation. Now all these three models, uh, these three inversion results fit the data uh, to the same degree and fit it very accurately. So uh, you can see that there's quite a flexibility uh, in the uh, inversion result. Um, and What's very important here is it's the auxiliary information which is controlling uh, which of these three possible interpretations we get. So the conclusions for this uh, subsection are that weighting functions are crucial uh, auxiliary information in any inversion that the depth, shape and geologic style of the inversion result is controlled by weighting functions and this applies to all geophysical surveys, not just potential fields, it applies to equally to EM, IP and seismic uh, surveys. That the proper use of weighting functions allows the geophysicist to select the correct class of models appropriate for a particular exploration scenario. So if, I'm, uh, if I know I'm uh, looking for something which is associated with uh, magnetic uh, sediments in paleo channels, then I can uh, uh, tune my inversion for that particular process. If, I'm, if uh, my geologist has told me that this is uh, an area where there's some sort of, I'm expecting the deep intrusives uh, coming up, uh, I can uh, tune my inversion to that type of uh, result. And weighting functions, because uh, they, have, they contain this uh, f um, important flexibility, uh, allow the geophysicist to explore the space of solutions uh, consistent with the geophysical data. So by varying the weighting function, the geophysicist can move around in the uh, space of equivalent uh, geophysical solutions. So that uh, <clears throat> concludes my um, presentation. I've only been able to touch on uh, a number of uh, different aspects of auxiliary information. There's a lot more we could talk about. Um, however, uh, I'll conclude here and the, the, just to summarize the points that we've found, um, that an optimum cell size uh, when you're doing a voxel inversion um, can be determined by studying the data uh, spectral con the data's spectral content and we're trying to aim for uh, effectively a uh, spectral content uh, with one data point per cell. Uh, we've found that padding domains are essential, um, however they can be quite modest and five uh, layers of cells seems to be uh, satisfactory. Uh, we've found that the cell geometry um, must conform to the terrain or it's necessary to continue data. Um, in fact, uh, about eight cell thicknesses to get uh, um, consistent results. We've found that absolute errors provide a uniform misfit distribution, um, but they may miss subtle features if you have extreme ranges in your data. We found that the error level size uh, or the regularization parameter can be sit, set using the misfit criterion quite effectively and uh, uh, it's usually necessary to supply some geophysical experience to get an optimum result. And finally that, uh, as I've just said a moment ago, weighting functions are critical uh, information in inversions and uh, can be used in a number of different ways to um, extract uh, information from an inversion or a geophysical data set. So uh, as a final conclusion I would say that um, geophysical inversion is grossly ill-posed and it definitely requires critical auxiliary information to produce a meaningful model.
and this implies that any meaningful inversion result must also clearly define all the auxiliary information together with the field data and in essence we really should be striving towards what's commonly called reproducible computing so that uh, we can go back and uh, reproduce the results that um, we've achieved on our inversion and so what we would advocate um, is that along with each inversion there's an auxiliary information checklist which goes through and specifies all the auxiliary information that goes into the inversion so an inversion actually contains data going in the inversion result itself and the auxiliary information associated with it and that concludes this presentation thank you for your attention